Hello, today I'll be talking about the arachidonic acid cascade and some medications that are related very closely to this cascade of um, chemical reactions that are happen happening in our body. Okay, um, let's talk about how does it start. Everything starts from the breakdown of membrane phospholipid by phospholipase A2. You might ask me, what is the, the source of membrane phospholipid? Well, it's actually on the cell membrane, we have this thing called a phospholipid bilayer. And when the cell receives injury, these cell membrane will be broken down by phospholipase A2, an enzyme into arachidonic acid. So from the arachidonic acid, it can go to two types of pathways. One is the uh, prostaglandin pathway, which is uh, catalyzed by cyclooxygenase, or COX in short. So I'll be covering about the COX first, because it's, more, it, it's probably more uh, sounding familiar to people who who are, who are, who are doing uh, pharmacology. So you, you, you might have heard of NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory uh, drugs, these are all NSAIDs, actually. NSAIDs, okay. So NSAIDs basically acts on this COX. I'll come back to it later, but basically from arachidonic acid, by the action of COX, it gets, it gets into prostaglandin A2. This prostaglandin A2 is pretty unstable, so it becomes prostaglandin H2 pretty quickly. Okay, from prostaglandin H2, it can be um, going to what any of the four things. And the speed at which they, they go to each of the um, products, they differ, well, um, according to situation as well as the, the location. Each organ has a different amount of different uh, type of enzymes that will catalyze these kind of reactions. But let me... Let me uh, introduce some of the um, main players in this section. So we have the prostaglandin I2, aka prostacycline. This guy is uh, gastric mucosa protective, so you can see the smiling stomach. Uh, it also supports the blood flow to the kidneys. It is cardioprotective because it's actually um, it. It doesn't promote uh, platelet aggregation. It does the opposite of platelet aggregation, basically, is to dissolve clots. It's also a vasodilator, but it also, also contributes to um, feeling of pain. All right. At the other, other hand, we have um, thromboxan A2, TXA for short. This guy is bad for the heart. You see the, the, the frowning heart here. So this, is, this guy is bad for the heart because it aggregates platelets, it, it causes vasoconstrictions, it can also cause bronchoconstrictions, so it's bad for asthmatics as well, and it's also like a hypertensive agent. So if you, if you observed that uh, prostaglandin I2 and thromboxin A2 are sort of like opposites of each other, okay? And it's quite interesting that uh, these two things that are, that are opposite in action comes from the same source, which means that uh, these two things has to be in equilibrium for a body to function. So you should note that because I'm going to come back to, to it later. Okay. We also have a prostaglandin D2, which bronchoconstricts as well as vasodilates, and prostaglandin E2, this one's very important as well because it causes fever. Also, it will uh, enhance the bradykinin action as well as um, it, um, it reduces the action of interleukin-2, interferon gamma, and uh, leukotrains. It's also a very potent labor inducer. Um, so you might have um, noticed if you've gone through the uh, obstetrics postings that uh, doctors may use prostaglandin E2 to induce a labor. And it makes sense for doctors to use uh, drugs that are opposite of prostaglandin E2, which is basically the NSAIDs, to stop labor. 
So the drug of choice sometimes for stopping the labor is in the medicine, which basically stops the cox and therefore there'll be less prostaglandin E2. In the babies, it keeps the PDA open. So sometimes when we want to keep the PDA open, we would uh, give the baby prostaglandin E2. And if you want to close the PDA, again, we would give the NSAIDs, NSAIDs which uh, I think the drug of choice is ibuprofen for babies with uh, whom we want to close the PDA. All right, so we've covered the uh, COX pathway, which is the prostaglandin and the thromboxane uh, that uh, arachidonic acid can go into. The other arm of the reaction is um, leukotrienes, basically. It's the leukotriene pathway. So from arachidonic acid, it can be converted by lipoxygenase into a high 5-HPETE. And this 5-HPETE can, can um, be broken down into leukotriene A4, leukotriene C4, leukotriene D4, and leukotriene E4. Those are also known as the slow-acting anaphylactic substances because these are a primary um, players in order to um, cause anaphylaxis in us and more, most importantly is um, in the, the, these actions in asthmatic patients. So we, we, what, what happens is that these, the, the asthmatic patients have more receptors for leukotrienes in their lungs which would cause them to have bronchoconstrictions when the leukotrienes are around. So we have drugs like Montelukast, which uh, actually is a receptor antagonist. So it competitively binds with the receptors so that all, all these leukotrienes can't bind uh, onto the lung receptors, hence preventing asthmatic attacks. So if you remember, in asthmatic patients, we have the beta blockers, which, which the, the action is uh, more um, autonomic in action, but we also have steroids, uh, which would reduce inflammation in the uh, in the bronchus. So steroids actually works. Um, go back all the way here. It would prevent one of the actions anyway. Steroids have lo a lot of actions, but one of the action is to uh, reduce the the action of this phospholipase A two, and hence you have much less of these leukotrienes that can cause asthma. Okay, I'm going to briefly talk about uh, lipoxin A, B, A4 and lipoxin B4. These are thought to reduce inflammation, especially the action of uh, leukotrienes. So we, we can say that these, again, are sort of opposites of e each other. But uh, we, don't, we don't know much about uh, lipoxin A and li lipoxin B. But people are trying to find out a lot, so uh, maybe there will be drugs that are, that are going to act on the lipoxin. Maybe. Okay. And I'm going to talk very briefly about leukotriene B4. This is a very potent uh, chemotactic agent. So it also it, uh, contributes to inflammation, that I can say. Okay. Since we've covered the whole of um, this arachidonic acid, uh, arachidonic acid cascade, now I'm going to talk about a bit about uh, how the some drugs like aspirin are not uh, recommended to be taken by asthmatics. And some people are very sensitive to aspirin and they can actually have like uh, asthmatic attacks from taking aspirin. Why does that happen? Okay, basically, when you take aspirin, the, the cox, aspirin is basically a cox inhibitor, so it's gonna inhibit this pathway. So what happens to the arachidonic acid? Uh, it's gonna create a backlog of arachidonic acid because all the arachidonic acid that has that, that was supposed to go to this pathway it can't because of the aspirin and hence it go this way instead and what it does and it, it will create more of the leukotrienes that would actually create a vessel uh, sorry bronchoconstriction of the airways and hence you have the asthmatic attacks that's one concept covered um, you might be asking me, okay, I know about, you know, COX. I've, I've had, heard of COX somewhere. It's actually 
the difference between COX-1 and COX-2 inhibitors. So let's talk a bit about that. So we do have COX-1 and COX-2 selective inhibitors. So, so what's the difference? So COX-1 actually uh, exists all over the body, so it's constitutional. Whereas COX-2 is inducible and it is present more in places where we are actively having inflammation. So in this case, I've illustrated like a knee, maybe rheumatoid arthritis or osteoarthritis, and you'll find lots of COX-2 um, receptors there. Okay, so the, those COX-2 selective um, drugs would actually act on the places where COX-2 are more abundant, whereas where um, the other NSAIDs will act on both COX-1 as well as COX-2. So um, these COX-2 are thought to act mainly on inflammation rather than the other parts of COX-1. And uh, as you know, like aspirin can cause uh, stomach upsets. That's because, you see down this way, the prostacyclin has a gastric protective function. And if this pathway is blocked by aspirin, uh, it's going to cause more damage to stomach thanks to blocking this thing. Um, okay, I'm going to talk a bit more about uh, aspirin because we use them all the time. We have this thing called aspirin dilemma here. What is this? It's, it's when we want to use aspirin to um, prevent the uh, platelet aggregation, is to prevent like... Um, um, cardiac events in people who are predisposed to cardiac events, like uh, people with atrial fibrillation. So when we use aspirin, we use low dose, 80 to 100 milligrams. So in that case, we would only inhibit the thromboxane as compared to the prostacycline pathway because prostacycline is actually good for the heart. So we don't want to inhibit uh, the prostaglandin pathways. However, in high dose, 200 to 300 milligrams, it will block both of these pathways. Thereby, it will reduce the efficacy at um, controlling the platelet aggregation. Very interesting. This is called um, aspirin dilemma. So in the case of platelets control, we like to use low dose of aspirin. Um, what else did I want to explain? I guess that's it for now. Bye.